story of three brothers, Fred, Trevor, and Damien. Fred, the eldest and the shortest of the three, is hardworking, ambitious, intelligent, and he has high expectations for himself and for those around him. Trevor, the middle, is social and very loyal, but he's also addicted. He began a relationship with drugs and alcohol that he's never really been able to end and that has affected much of his life. Damien, the baby, and the tallest of the three, is athletic, charismatic, incredibly generous, and he's good looking, so he's the one that all the girls loved. The three of them grew up in pretty bad poverty in a small town in Alabama. So what this looked like for them is that most of the time, their parents had the ability to pay the bills, keep the lights on. Most of the time, they had the ability to put food on the table, but they never got new school supplies, new clothes for school. They rarely went to the dentist or to the doctor. They never went on family vacations. Many of these things felt like luxuries to this family. Both of their parents dropped out of school around the middle school level, and both had grown up in generational poverty, and so much of this seemed normal to them, and they didn't expect anything different or better for themselves, and certainly not for the boys. A UN official has recently said that Alabama has the worst poverty in our developed world. The brothers knew that they wanted more. They knew that they wanted something different. So think about your family, your friends, your colleagues. We all know people who are represented in one or more of these stories. Think about yourself. You know, we all know people who are hardworking and ambitious. For better or for worse, we all know people who are addicted. And we all know people who are charismatic and good looking. And poverty, well, that's part of America's story. This story matters to me because one of those three men is my dad. The other two are my uncles and their parents are my paternal grandparents. Who do you think my dad is? Why? So I'm gonna tell you something that you probably know but don't often think about. The effects of poverty start in the womb. So we already know that when pregnant moms are addicted to drugs or alcohol, their babies enter the world addicted to that same substance. Well, poverty and chronic stress have a similar effect and similar relationship between pregnant mom and baby. And when moms are living in poverty and experiencing chronic stress, they have babies who enter the world with little brains and little bodies that are already compromised. And while their little bodies will catch up to their higher income peers more quickly, their brains take a little bit more work. All of us enter the world with an undeveloped brain. The first three years of life are critical to brain development because about 80 to 85% of our brain develops during that time. There's a great book by Eric Jensen called Teaching with Poverty in Mind. And he talks about the importance of the attachment formed between parent and child. And he tells us that the quality of that first relationship will predict the quality of future relationships. He also reminds us that a parent essentially serves as a child's first teacher. So that first relationship is important in teaching children things like emotional regulation, independence, and curiosity. We also know that low-income children are read fewer books to, and so they know fewer words. They're also less likely to attend a high-quality pre-K or child care facility, and so most of them will start off school academically behind. And for many of those students, they won't ever reach the same level as their higher income peers. So as they continue to develop and go throughout school, we know that low-income children are more likely to act out, to behave impulsively, and are more likely to lack coping skills. They also develop less gray matter in the frontal part of their brain, and that part of the brain controls cognitive functions, so things like problem solving, planning, organizing, and focusing. And all of those effects will follow a young person into adulthood. And for adults who live in poverty, many of them are experiencing chronic stress. So a little bit of stress is actually good for our brains and our bodies. But when stress becomes consistent and lasts over an extended period of time, it becomes chronic or toxic stress. That chronic stress sets up a process in our bodies that does a few things, but among one is that it increases our levels of cortisol, a hormone in our body, to a level that our brains and body really can't manage or maintain. And that increased level of cortisol decreases our ability to fight infections, is linked to weight gain, 
diabetes, cardiovascular issues, and early death. So living in poverty can literally kill us. In addition to that, low-income adults are more likely to be unemployed, underemployed, and have to rely on social service systems. So my grandparents had to use what is now called SNAP, what used to be called food stamps, in order to frequently put food on the table for the boys. So I know what some of you in the room may be thinking. Whew, that sounds bad. Thank goodness that doesn't have anything to do with me. Well, the thing is, poverty affects every single one of us, even if we don't think it does. And we all have a place in the solution. And I've heard all the reasons and excuses why we don't have a place in the solution. You know, I've heard people say that it's the responsibility of the parent to parent their child. I've heard people say that when children are academically behind, it's the responsibility of the teachers and the school staff to raise them up academically. And finally, I've heard people just say that this isn't their problem. So let's think about parents for a second. Think about your parents. If you're a parent, Think about yourself as a parent. Parents are humans, right? So the reality is they all do things that they wish they would have done differently or would have done better. And all of those effects of poverty I mentioned can absolutely impact and affect someone's ability to be a parent. And the reality is parents aren't always going to do what we think they should do or meet our expectations. So let's think about teachers. Gosh, teachers do a lot of things, right? They're hired to provide academic content and support students, but they do a lot more than that, particularly teachers of low-income students. You know, they're part nurse, part mentor, part disciplinarian. Many of them are providing school supplies and potentially food out of their own budget. And it's not our responsibility to put more burden on them, but instead, it's our responsibility to ask them how we can support them in the work that they're already doing. So finally, I've heard people say it's just not their problem, right? So all of those social support systems that I previously mentioned, again, what SNAP used to be called food stamps that my grandparents had to utilize, TANF that used to be called welfare, our tax dollars are going to pay for that. So we are financially invested in poverty. And as we can lift some of our neighbors out of poverty, some of those funds that are currently being diverted to social service systems can be diverted to other things, you know, things you care about. Maybe it's transportation or education or veterans issues. But again, as we lift people up, we can divert some of those funds. So again, we're all affected by poverty. And we all have a place in the solution. And it starts with empathy. Empathy. So Dr. Brene Brown, who's a social worker and storyteller, describes empathy as feeling with people. And while I can't always connect to someone's specific experience, I can connect, connect to the feeling. You know, I don't know what it's like to be a mom living in poverty, but I do know what it's like to want a child to be happy and to be loved and to be safe. That feeling, I can connect to. And empathy requires two things. First, it requires us to put judgment aside because empathy and judgment can't live together. So in order for us to feel with people, it requires us to put judgment in a corner. Next, it requires perspective taking. It requires us to take the perspective of another and think about what life is like in their shoes, again, in order to feel with them. And empathy isn't just a bunch of happy feelings, right? There's some action associated with empathy. So I know we've all seen the Facebook ad, the mailer, the commercial for XYZ nonprofit, and they need your time and they need your money, and some of them are asking you for both. And I know that there are some of you in the room that are giving your time or your money, and some of you are giving both. But I know that there are some of you that aren't. And for those of you that are, I'd first like to say thank you, but I'd like to ask you, could you be doing more? Could you be bringing people alongside of you in the work that you're doing with these nonprofits? Could you be giving more of your resources? And for those of you that aren't, I'd like to ask you why you're not. Why aren't you taking your place in this solution? And for all of us, I'd like to ask us, what can we be doing to help fix the problem of poverty? What is our place in the solution? So earlier, I asked you who my dad is, and I asked you why you think that. So I am incredibly proud to say that my dad's name is Fred Sharp, the eldest of the three. And he's currently a divisional vice president and CFO at a publicly traded company in Houston, Texas. Thank you.